introductory interpretation, and this is week three. And this week we deal with the topic of interpreting legislation, which I guess is central to a topic of statutory interpretation as a unit. So um, the reading material provides you with a great deal of commentary about the topic generally. I'll be fairly specific in this session, dealing once again primarily with issues that arise from the Acts Interpretation Act of Queensland. Before I do some comments about authors on the importance and emergence of statutory interpretation, uh, none less than the Honourable Michael Kirby, a former High Court Justice, who said, um, statutory interpretation has replaced the analysis of judicial reasons about the common law as the most important task ordinarily performed by Australian lawyers. Kirby goes on to say this was inevitable as the amount of law made by or under legislation increased and the room for residual common law narrowed. So you can see from that quote that there is essentially a dynamic between statutory law and common law which is evolving. A hundred years ago, by far, our law was comprised of common law. Relatively speaking, there were very few statutes. That has turned around. Now statutory interpretation, rather than interpretation of the common law, is primarily what we do as, law as lawyers in practice. That's the importance of statutory interpretation and the need to interpret legislation appropriately. What you would have gleaned from the first two weeks is that there are a couple of key words that you need to consider, come back to on a regular basis in relation to statutory interpretation. One of them is context, another is purpose. Keep those words handy and talk about the contextual approach talk about the purposive approach in the context of the legislation and some of the key cases, um, such as Project Blue Sky. So in the context of the contextual approach, courts adopt a contextual approach to interpretation. What that means is that courts take into context a wide range of things in considering um, when determining the ordinary meaning of a word contained within legislation. It's a style that's on the way to the purpose of approach, but it's not quite as broad. And the contextual approach is derived from common law. Now, the purpose of approach, one that we've seen in the Acts Interpretation Act in our discussion last week, is one where the interpretation of a statute is considered and it interprets a statute where there may or may not be an oversight or an error. The oversight or error when corrected must support and add value to the argument. So the purpose of approach considers, firstly, what was the mischief that parliament was dealing with in enacting the legislation? And consider also the possibility that parliament inadvertently overlooked an eventuality that must be dealt with by considering the purpose that the act was intended to achieve. And then of course, try to convince others, namely a court, that your approach is the correct approach. I mean, I'll take a, an example. Um, legislation may provide for what drivers are supposed to do when they reach a solid line at an in intersection. Might, you know, maybe they have to do this or that. You know, if you're defending someone who's charged with uh, an offence relating to that scenario, it might be that you can prove that they did the this or the that, but they just didn't do that at the line. And police prosecution may take a very firm view that the, the law says you must go to the line before you do these things. Well, is it that important that you are actually literally at the line? Or was the purpose to ensure that people stopped and they did things, they, they looked around them 
Is that the important issue? Is that the real purpose of the legislation? So therefore, by arguing the purpose of approach to legislation, relying upon the statutory provisions in the Acts Interpretation Act, you may be in a position to provide um, your client, if you're in defence, with some assistance. Now, let's um, share the screen and let's have a look at some of the specific provisions that um, follow on from the Acts Interpretation Act and our discussion from last week. So just bear with me a moment while we find that appropriate screen. Now, the Acts Interpretation Act provides for a wide range of issues and scenarios. And continuing our discussion from last week, let's have a look at Section 22. Section 22 talks about the interplay of the Act and the Amending Act. So now when you receive, when you read an Act, it's really the consolidated legislation of the original Act and the Amending Acts. Um, you might recall that um, I spoke about what it was like in the old days where we used to literally have to cut and then paste in with glue the amendments. So now the internet does all that for us. Um, an Act and all amending Acts are to be read as one. And that's why we read all the amending pieces of legislation into the Act. Next section is section 22A, which talks about the, the practical way in which provisions in an amending Act are inserted into the original Act. And you'll see in the Acts Interpretation Act, plenty of examples of this. So section 22 is in itself an example of the way in which amendments are included because they're normally done with an A, a capitalized A as an insertion. If we go back to the table of provisions, you'll see plenty of examples of that. 22A, B and C are all insertions. Now, when there's a deletion, we don't uh, repeat that number or use it again. So example section 24 is now repealed, but 24AA and A and B and C survive. So they remain as standalone provisions. And note that where you go from um, A to AA, the AA go, precedes it. So that's what section 22A is all about. Section 22B talks about amendments and if it's possible to change the law, the preference is to amend it by omitting and inserting words rather than replacing completely. So if a, an act amends a provision by omitting a word and inserting another word or inserting a word before a particular word, the amendment is to be made where possible in the provision. 23 provides for the automatic repeal of amending acts in certain circumstances. Now that may be relevant when you're trying to carefully determine the extent to which the legislation is relevant for answering a particular scenario. Section 23 deals with the issue of statutory function. Now, it's common for statutes to provide that individuals or bodies are conferred with certain functions and powers and then go on to talk about the way in which they're to exercise those powers. That might be relevant if you have a scenario where someone purports to undertake some form of executive action, executive meaning the government. And if you're looking to challenge that decision-making process, one of the very first things you should do is determine whether that person had the statutory power to undertake the executive function, given that the executive have no inherent power to do anything and all must be conferred upon them. And secondly, when that, whether that particular person received the power appropriately in order to act upon it. Section 24A, A, 
talks about power to make an instrument or decision, which includes the power to amend or repeal. In other words, if someone has the power to make or decide, that carries with it now as a result of this amendment, power to amend or repeal decisions or documents. Now, you'll see that it's a, a provision that was inserted. And I don't know the specific case or instance that led to this, but I'd be confident in assuming that it came about as a result of a decision of a court based on an argument that someone didn't have the appropriate authority to amend or repeal something. So the law was tightened up by Parliament to ensure that they now do have that statutory ability to amend or repeal in certain circumstances. Now let's look at section 27A. Again, I want you to read all of these in detail. So I'm just selecting those that I think are most relevant. You'll see 27A, again, it's something that was introduced by way of amendment, provides for the delegation of functions or powers. In a practical sense, this is very important because much of our law and much of our, the way in which our law is regulated is done through delegation. And you'll often come across this term delegated legislation. So if an act authorizes a person or a body to delegate a function or a power, they may do so pursuant to the terms of the legislation. And that section 27A provides for the mechanism by which the delegation is to take effect. Bear that section in mind if you're ever considering the lawfulness of a delegation or the way in which that delegation was effected in a practical sense. Next section is section 29, which deals with legislative assembly resolutions not to be interpreted to be interpreted not to exceed authority. So the Legislative Assembly in Queensland, of course, is Parliament. They don't have an upper house. Um, so a resolution of the Assembly or a committee of the Assembly should not be, is to be interpreted to the extent that it went to the powers of the authority, uh, the, the Parliament or the committee, but not beyond that. So what that tells me is that if you're looking at some law, you must always consider whether it was in the statutory um, constitutional power of the parliament to make that law. You shouldn't assume that. And part of your training as lawyers and law students is to be critical and to challenge that which is presented to you. You guard against taking things at face value. In other words, just because Parliament made the law, therefore they must have had the authority to do so. Well, they probably did, but then you can't assume that. Section 32A, and you can see that my bandwidth is struggling now, but Section 32 um, is important and then 32A. So 32 is part of this section that deals with the way in which we um, interpret some particular words. And section 32 says that if a, an act defines a word or an expression, other parts of speech or grammatical forms of the word or expression have corresponding meanings. Watch out for that when you're looking at a definition term. So, you know, if the word take is defined, then the word taken should be regarded as, as having the, the corresponding meaning to the principal word. That might be common sense, but as you become more involved in statutory interpretation, you're looking for these sorts of issues and you need to come back to the Acts Interpretation Act to provide answers to questions that might be going through your mind as you read these provisions. So section 32A is important because it has one of those key words, context. Definitions are to be read in context. Definitions in an applicable act, except so far as the context or subject matter otherwise indicates, 
or requires uh, should apply. So again, we're looking at the way in which you must consider everything within appropriate context. Keep these sections in mind if you're wanting to include um, some authority for propositions that you make. Section 32AA um, provides that definitions generally apply to an entire act. So, uh, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you'll find a definition that applies to a particular chapter or part or even division of an act and not necessarily apply to the entire act. So again, section 32AA applies as the general provision but can be overridden in a particular act. Now, I'll just um, I mentioned something earlier about the way in which we use double A's. Uh, sometimes you'll see that they go above A. So if you look at section 24, double A, it's introduced above section 24A. Sometimes the reverse applies. So look at section 32, double A, that's included after section 32A just depends on where it fits most logically. Now, section 32AB talks about the way in which terms might be defined in this act and another act. And it talks about non-exhaustive as opposed to exhaustive definitions. And it talks about the Interpretation Act definition. Now, you don't need to worry about this too much right now, but, as you're interpreting legislation, you will need to consider whether a definition is intended by Parliament to be exhaustive or non-exhaustive. Is it to be a complete statement or an incomplete statement? So a non-exhaustive definition is one that generally is not, that allows for something beyond as opposed to an exhaustive definition, which is intended to be a complete statement. Catalog this information because it's all important uh, for you to, to keep and um, access when required. Now, section 32B deals with gender. Um, what we need, want to try, what we seek to do in drafting is avoid the he slash c she situation. Um, so one way of doing it, it's a lazy way, is just to say he or just to say she. We're relying on section 32b as meaning one gender includes the other gender. But it's a bit vague because really, you know, are there two genders? Do we have more? Um, Try to think of a more neutral way of drafting your material, but keep 32B in mind as a fallback position. 32C deals with numbers and words in the singular include the plural and words in the plural include the singular. In other words, you know, if there's a piece of legislation that talks about an incident, let's say in the context of domestic violence, um, section 32C says, well, it might refer to singular, but that is regarded as being plural as well. The plural applies just as much as the singular and vice versa. Section 32CA is important because it makes the distinction between some key words. You'll see these words often in the practice of law, may and must. It talks about the permissive as opposed to the mandatory. May, meaning it just is discretionary, it's permissible. Must means it's mandatory and fixed. So um, in the context of the use of a discretionary power or power generally, do keep in mind section 32 CA and think back to refer to it if in legislation you see reference to someone um, having an ability or being able to may, may 
do something as opposed to must do something. The next section, 32CB, talks about words and expressions used in amending acts, and they have the same meaning as they have in the other law. So it doesn't need a fresh definition, for example. Section 32D has reference to persons generally, meaning that an act, uh, in, a, in an act, a reference to a person generally includes a reference to a corporation as well as an individual. So a legal person can therefore include a company or a corporation. Goes on to provide some specific examples where it may refer to an individual or a corporation. The next section, 32 DA, deals with the issue of what is meant by a de facto pardon. Now, in the Family Law Act, in Commonwealth legislation, there is specific legislation that deals with issues around uh, this as well, but it's a very common matter for courts to determine whether a person is a de facto partner or not. And there are a number of factors that need to be considered in that regard. That might be relevant, for example, in the context of determining whether there is a relevant relationship in a domestic violence matter under the Domestic Violence and Family Protection Act, Queensland. The next section is section 35 that I wish to draw your attention to. And section 35 is in a number of relevant parts. A reference to Queensland is to be implied in the context of referring to an officer, office or entity. Merely because it doesn't say the word Queensland doesn't mean it's not meant to be Queensland. 35A deals with a reference to person with interest in land, including a personal representative. Personal representative is um, usually um, a person who is stepping into the shoes of that person, usually in the case of an executor under a will. 32C expands on what we discussed last week in the context of what is part of an act. And here it specifically says that a heading to a chapter, part, division, subdivision, or other provision forms part of that provision to which it is a heading. This is probably not specifically needed because of other legislation that we talked about last week in the Acts Interpretation Act, but it's still nevertheless useful. And it provides for issues around how to interpret and or but words that are conjunctive words that you see regularly in the context of reading interpret and interpreting legislation. So keep that in mind when you're coming to make a decision about how to read a section and the importance of those conjunctive words in particular. 35 CA talks about reference to items at the end of a provision And we'll just go now to section 35E, which talks about instruments made under an act. You'll see the word instrument a lot. Essentially, an instrument is a document, um, but it might be a contract or a deed. It might be a statutory instrument. And the reason I'm mentioning this is I mentioned last week the Statutory Instruments Act. So read section 35E in conjunction with the Statutory Instruments Act generally. Then we have section 36, which talks about the meaning of commonly used words and expressions. In an act, a term defined in Schedule 1 has a meaning stated in that schedule. And in an act, a reference to Schedule 1 of this act includes a reference to this section. So 
we determined previously that schedules um, where definition terms are often kept form part of the Act. So do have a look at the schedule in this Act. Section 37 talks about applying distance. You'll often see a reference to distances in legislation. And distance is to be measured along the shortest road usually used for traveling, unless there's a contrary intention that distance be measured in a straight line on a horizontal plane or in any other way. So if we talk about not uh, again, within a um, context of an, an, a definition where there's distance involved, 100 metres, that's usually by the shortest road, not as the crow flies, so to speak. Next section, reckoning of time, section 38. If a day is allowed for, then the way in which it's uh, calculated is exclude the day on which the purpose is to be fulfilled and include the day on which the purpose is to be fulfilled. So that's the way in which we reckon time generally. That might be relevant for calculation of um, dates in so criminal law matters. Section 38A talks about age. And for the purpose of the Act, a person is an age in years at the beginning of the person's birthday for the age. So when we talk about someone who's 17 years of age, that means the day that they become 17. Section 39 talks about the service of documents and the way in which that's affected by some of the old fashioned ways of service, including post, but still very prevalent. Now that might be important when you're asked to answer a question where it may not be clear whether someone, the defendant, for example, has been appropriately served. Section 39A talks about the meaning of service by post and the way in which it's to be taken to be affected in the ordinary course of the post. Section 41 talks about penalties at the end of the provision, indicating that where an offence is committed or a contravention, there may be minimums and maximums that apply in those circumstances. That's particularly relevant in sentencing for offenders. The next section is 41A, dealing with penalties other than at the end of the provision. 42 is interesting. Any person may take proceedings for the imposition or enforcement of a penalty or make him a forfeiture order under an act. We don't see many private prosecutions, but it's, but it's provided for there. 43, the apportionment of penalties may become important in certain circumstances. Where there's multiple parties. And section 44 talks about summary proceedings. Now, summary proceedings, you'll see this quite often. A reference to that which is a summary proceeding, particularly in the context of criminal law, means a proceeding that is conducted in the magistrate's court as opposed to a proceeding which is, for example, on indictment in a criminal law context, which is um, in the district or Supreme Court in Queensland. But the same sort of things apply for civil proceedings where a matter might be determined summarily meaning essentially in the magistrate's court. And you'll see that um, the magistrate's court is guided in, in large fashion by the provisions in the Justices Act 1886. And we're getting down to the last couple now. The next section is section 45. This is interesting because it provides for 
um, a circumstance that otherwise covered in the context of criminal law in section 16 and 17 of the criminal code. If an act or offence is uh, such that the offender may be prosecuted and punished under any of those laws, the offender is not to be punished more than once for the same offence. And finally, for today's work, section 46 talks about body corporate. A provision of an act relating to offences punishable on indictment or summary conviction applies to body corporates as well as individuals. I had one recently where, um, to stop the share. And I've just realised, I think, during this entire thing, I wasn't referring, you probably, the camera was probably still on me the whole time. My apologies. Have a look at the Acts Interpretation Act. I'm sure that was easy to follow. Um, had, just on body corporates, I had one recently where there was a prosecution of a body corporate and the individual directors. And a very common way of resolving that is for prosecution eventually to offer no evidence against the individuals, but to prosecute only the company in those circumstances. All right, that'll do for today. Thank you very much for your patience. Please keep working steadily through the study guides, the lectures, keep attending the tutorials, um, make sure you've read the assessment pieces, you're on top of that and you're starting to prepare for that work. We'll end the session now and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next occasion.